Hello, my fairy tale things. This is Austin the Brimstone with more Shrek things. Specifically, a book. This is Shrek the Complete Guide, or as complete as 2007 Shrek was. So, uh, this is from Shrek the Thorn, if you couldn't tell by the giant emblem here. And uh, this used to be like a part of every movie tie in. They would always do these kind of complete guides. And uh, as somebody that likes to consume vast amounts of information and hyper fixations on movies, I was so into these as a kid. I have so many memories of going to my local school book fairs and buying the essential guide of whatever summer movie I was into, whether it was Over the Hedge or B-Movie or Monsters vs. Aliens or the like like that. Uh, there's really nothing essential about these guides. These were mostly just one-offs for single movies, packed with tons of useless information you did not need. But Shrek, of course, became a huge franchise. By this point, there were already three Shrek movies. And this, this, folks, is not the essential guide. See, three movies in Shrek, we don't need any of that essential guide anymore. We have the complete guide. Apparently, this is complete. This is everything we ever needed to know on Shrek. Kind of. Not really. But I thought it was fun to look at because I did look through this before and there's some pretty funny stuff in here. So this was made by DK, the same people that did all of those guides for all of those movies. But this one does have a little bit more charm and character in it than the other books. Uh, first of all, the presentation is quite nice. It's actually got this soft cover, and you cannot feel this, you the viewer, but just know that it's got a very nice texture. It's good to just kind of rub your hand and feel it. It's very puffy, like one of those puffy stickers they used to make. And apparently at one point it featured a pull-out map of the world of Shrek. Unfortunately, that map is missing. I know, a tragedy. But there is a little bit of that map printed in the book, so we're still going to get to see it. So let's just get right on into it. And here we are, Shrek the Complete Guide. And pretty much what these guides do is they just get key art or promotional art, as it's called, of the characters, uh, 3D renders or 2D renders, depending on the movie. And they just do these little, like, factoids around them, like how Shrek has an attractive green complexion, which we all know is completely true, and a vest made from alligator skin. Most of the time, it's completely useless information that you could already figure out by looking at the render on its own. But it is going to allow us to look at some clean Shrek renders. And uh, I, I used key art. You could also call these key art depending on whether it's a 3D render or 2D thing. The point is, it's all promotional stuff. So, let's get right into it. There's Shrek and Donkey. And it says, Once upon a time, there was a large green ogre who became a great hero, a small donkey who became his noble steed, and a beautiful princess who kept a mysterious secret. This is their story. So, it's not specific to Shrek the Thorn, thankfully. It's rather all of Shrek. But these little touches I'm talking about that make this book great, like look here on the bottom. So it's kind of presented as a storybook. And it says, publisher's note, please do not use the pages from this book as toilet paper. This may impair your enjoyment of the tale. That, that is quality right there. That is somebody who pays attention to Shrek. So there he is. There is Shrek. And uh, I am not going to read this. You can pause the video if you want to read all this. But basically, it's everything you wanted to know about Shrek, how he eats slugs and bugs, uh, how he keeps his clothes damp and covered in mildew. Shrek soaks them in stagnant swamp water and then leaves them in the shade to fester. Ew. I don't know if that's necessarily true. I think they just animated Shrek in a dirty tunic. Uh, resourceful ogres use their vast quantities of earwax to make candles. Like, I think just Shrek did that. And you can tell this is uh, pre-Forever After because it does not point out that those 
ogle ears are actually used to blow a battle cry, a battle horn, uh, as we see in the fourth movie. Okay, here is Shrek's Swamp. And this, this is the stuff I like. So rather than just simple screenshots from the movie, uh, we actually have a very nice render of Shrek's house, the interior here. And uh, I don't know if this was the one used for the production of the movie or if this was just made for the book. I, I would just say that it's for the book. Like, why would Shrek's uh, house in the movie be this proportionate. Uh, it, it, it's not shown like this. It would be easier just to animate it one room at a time, right? And then show different camera angles. But the detail here is extraordinary, which makes me think that this may actually be the case, that they did animate the scenes, the settings, as full maps, like you would with a uh, video game, and then just kind of had a uh, in-game camera move around. I don't know. I'm not a 3D animator. I don't know how this stuff works. I just watch the movies and collect the toys. But uh, it does look exactly like Shrek's house, especially if you've played the new Roblox Shrek game. It's pretty mid, but uh, you do get to go in Shrek's house in it, and it looks just like this with this layout. Oh, look at Donkey. Wow. And it says, uh, who could resist such soulful brown eyes? Indeed, indeed. And it's, here's Donkey's kids, and it says, Donkey loves being a dad, and he gives his, his kids cool names, like Peanut, Coco, Parfait, Bananas, and Debbie. And notice that it only lists one, two, three, four, five. So we have five of Donkey's kids here, and if you've seen Shrek 2, Donkey actually has six babies. One of them is missing, and that missing Donkey is Eclair. For some reason, Eclair does not appear in any Shrek media past Shrek 2. And uh, all of his kids are named after food, of course. You know, Peanut, Banana, Parfait. Some people online say that Debbie is the exception, but that's not true. Debbie's named after Little Debbie, the snack cakes. Okay, Princess Fiona as an ogress, which we've said many times on this channel, is the superior Fiona. We all know she's better in her ogress form, right? And uh, it says, that Fiona finds Shrek as charming as any prince. You know it's true love when you try to outbelch each other. Indeed, indeed. And here's some of the more useless details. Uh, royal dress designed with high kicks in mind. See, I don't know about that. Like, when they locked her in that tower, I think Harold and Lillian just kind of left her to rot. Like, they did not think she would be defending herself. Uh, it does talk a little bit about Shrek the Third here, how she is Prego's. And uh, here are the fairy tale squatters, and it points out witches and wizards and, you know, dwarves and all that stuff. I've actually never noticed that there's, like, a generic wizard guy, like, just with a boring-looking witch's hat. He almost looks like the old Lego Dumbledore, just like the most generic, molin looking wizard, but... You know, that's the thing with Shrek 1 is they didn't quite have the art style down yet. Some of the characters look really off, like... I think uh, Snow White and even, like, Rumpelstiltskin show up, and they change appearances throughout the movies. Actually, I think Rumpelstiltskin is in Shrek the Third, not Shrek 1. Fact-checking myself there. But uh, here are some more of the fairy tale friends, right? Here's kind of the ones you see in all of the marketing material, but we also have, like, Hansel and Gretel, who are barely in it. Hansel and Gretel have real sweet teeth. They even eat the sugar versions of the witch's house. The big bad wolf wears old lady's clothes, even when he's not trying to eat Red Riding Hood. The three little pigs stay on strict diets to make sure they remain little. And it says here with the three little pigs, um, this pig wear, uh, this pigs hopefully wear hats. Oh, the pig, the pigs. I don't know why I'm, oh, this pig, here we go. Because I was reading it like the poem, right? Like this little piggy and this little piggy. That would have been fun if, if it read like that, but... It seems it is not written like that. Moving on, we have Gingy. Gingy is like the soul of Shrek, let's be real here. And it says, uh, he may look soft and sweet, but he is one tough cookie. Well, especially in the fourth one, when he uh, becomes a gladiator. And here we have a bit on Mongo, R.I.P. Mongo. And then uh, probably one of the only actually charming and funny sequences in Shrek the Third, when we see Gingy's life flashing before his eyes. Um, that bit was, if I had to guess, that was probably written by Conrad Vornan, who 
voice is gingy. Maybe that's why it's so funny. And unlike the rest of Shrek the Thawd, which is just kind of like, eh. Oh yeah, remember when uh, Gingy got like a baby pouch? Uh, Pinocchio got a baby pouch for Gingy? That was another one of those things like, Shrek the Thawd had all these different plot lines and things that didn't go anywhere. But Pinocchio and Gingy had like a very brief friendship. I mean, they do like loosely interact in Shrek too, but you know, they're not like full on bros. What does it say here? Not one to shy away from the spotlight. Pinocchio loves to take center stage when there's a microphone around. I guess he does. Kind of. And then it says, This boy toy sure can boogie. Okay, Shrek book. Please never use the phrase boy toy ever again. Thank you. Uh, here is Lord Farquaad. Scheming expression. Like, what is that supposed to mean? And what else does it say here? Uh... Manly frame with a little help from padded shoulders. It'd be great if it just had a line pointing and it just said, looks like Michael Eisner, and that maybe he's uh, overcompensating for something. Cookie cruelty. Here we go, fun with Thelonious. Thelonious was Farquaad's henchman. He all his magical tips for top torture. Okay, we're gonna learn on people. Intimidate at all times. If the magic meal gets lippy, scale them into silence by smashing a shiny object. See, this is what I'm talking about. Like, it's trying to present factoids, but because they can't actually expand on the lore, they don't have DreamWorks permission, they kind of just summarize the movie. And all these complete essential guides are kind of like this, where you buy them thinking you're going to learn some more lore, but in reality, it just kind of summarizes you on the movie, but... You know, not to be too critical, like, they all fun books for kids. And, you know, pre-internet, pre-wikia, like, I used to just sit around for hours looking at these books. Especially if I got one before a movie came out. Like, I remember actually getting some of the books for WALL-E before that movie came out. And just really reading them front to cover. And taking in the world of WALL-E and, you know, by and large and all those robots. And when I saw the movie... Uh, it actually kind of enhanced the experience, because, like, as each character showed up, I was like, oh, that's this so-and-so robot that does this thing. But maybe that's just me. I've always just been the type of person that likes to take in loads of information. Anyways, let's learn the rest of Thelonious's, um facts here. Don't be squeamish. If that gingerbread won't talk, dunk him in milk. Damn, he's talking about waterboarding? I thought this was Duloc, not Guantanamo Bay. Don't miss mix business with pleasure. It's bad manners to eat someone you've just tortured. Under that hood, he might be a good-looking guy. My headcanon is that there's nothing under that hood, and that Thelonious doesn't have a head. Wouldn't that be hilarious? And, uh, here is, uh, Farquaad's grave, also overcompensating for something. And this is actually from the Universal Studios ride, so uh, looks like they got access to a bit more than I would have thought with the uh, book here. And here's Duloc, good old liminal-looking Duloc. You can learn all about it. One of Farquaad's perfect penthouses. See, I never, I never thought about that. So when Farquaad is in bed and he's just kind of creepily ogling Fiona in his blanket. Is he, like, all the way up here on top of this tower? Is this his penthouse? Hey, I may have actually learned a bit of Shrek lore from this book. How about that? But, you know, you have, like, the rules of Duloc, and it's just a printed version of the Duloc song. But stuff like this, like, pre-internet was really cool because you would just have to watch the movie again and try and memorize the words to this. But here it is. And heck... There may be some information in this book that still isn't on Wiki Shrek. No offense to Wiki Shrek, but some of you guys' information is a little long. Uh, dragon. Uh, unfortunately, it just says Dragon, not Elizabeth, but that whole dragon's name being Elizabeth is kind of a uh, more recent phenomenon in the Shrek fandom. I mean, Donkey does say it in Shrek 2, but I don't think there's like any fans calling her Elizabeth uh, back when the movies came out. And, you know, it just tells you neat things. Let's, let's learn some love tips from Elizabeth. Uh, she says, To line your layer with gold and gemstones, they set off the gleam in your eyes. Yeah, dragon is like sitting on top of a hoard of treasure, as all dragons do, but I find it funny that they never go back for that treasure. Like, you'd think Prince Charming 
when uh, he goes to the Dragon's Lair in Shrek 2 would take at least a little bit of gold. I mean, that castle was just waiting to be pillaged, but maybe maybe somebody else took it all. Because uh, remember, the, the big bad wolf is in Fiona's bed when Prince Charming arrives. So maybe that's my headcanon, that like the three little pigs and Gingy and all of them, right? They're all buds. They just took it all. Maybe Gingy uh, and Pinocchio walked in with their baby swaddle because they're bros and they just took all the gold. You hoard it here first. That will be mentioned in Shrek 5, right? Okay, so let's go to Strange Enchantment. This is just all about Fiona's course. And I do like that we get a little bit of the daily Duloc paper here. Talks just a little bit about the wedding where Farquaad got eaten. And uh, Donkey observed celebrity marriages. They never do last. Which is funny, because that's, that's the actual line from the movie. So, again, we have, like, the writing here incorporating dialogue from the film. So, either DreamWorks had super strict guidelines, although I doubt that. I'm more so willing to bet that whoever wrote this book, and uh, I think it said in the beginning here, uh, right? I could have sworn, oh, there we go. St uh, Stephen Cole, Stephen Cole, however you say it, uh, he seemed to really care and put a lot of thought into this Shrek lore. And we do have some newspaper advertisements here of interest, so let's look at these. And it says, wanted a benevolent ruler over the kingdom of Duloc. Oh yeah, because Farquaad's dead. Well, we learned later on that Duloc did not get a leader, that it was abandoned in Scared Shrekless. And then it says Pixie Porges. Um, I'm just going to peek a little bit off camera here so I can read this. And it says Pesky Pixies can be bad for your health. Clear them today with Thelonious's Pest Control. So I guess Thelonious, uh, he went from Executioner to Pest Control. He can kind of get his killing out of his system by killing lots of tiny bugs. Kind of like that guy from Smiling Friends, the uh, Mike Stoklasa dude that becomes the bug exterminator. Uh, out for a limb. If you're made of cookies, uh, you know, you can go to Legs R Us and Drury Lane. And then it says Beanstalks visits Jack's Emporium and Let's Talk Beans. Oh, so I guess they're just selling the magic beans. Humpty Dumpty and Puss in Boots spent all those years looking for beans. They just needed to go to Duloc. Except Duloc didn't exist when they were kids. But, you know, how, how dare I point out logic in my own attempts at finding plot holes. Now we have Just Married. And this is the uh, honeymoon page. And it pretty much just summarizes everything that happens on Shrek and Fiona's honeymoon. Although it does contain this interesting render of Shrek in his beach gear here. And it says, traditional ogre swimsuit and donkey set for fun. But if you watch Shrek 2, this is not the swimsuit that Shrek wears. He actually wears a different one. Uh, this render here is separate from the movie. It, it's not in the film at all. But I believe this was used on like a couple of backyard pool toys for the merchandise. So, yeah, I don't know what's up with that render there. It seems like a waste of money to make a uh, unique outfit. But anyways, moving on, we have uh, the map of Shrek's world. So this would have been included as a separate piece if you owned this book when it was new. But unfortunately, uh, the map is long gone. Thankfully, we have this printed one. So we're just going to look here. And it is a, I would say, fine and serviceable map of Shrek's world up until this point. You know, they only include the things from Shrek 1, 2, and 3. But I'm surprised DreamWorks was okay with this because it kind of establishes some odd canon. Like, we have places that don't really exist, like the Unicorn Pass, and something called the Forbidden Forest, which I guess could either be the forest that uh, Fiona and Shrek battle Robin Hood in, in the first movie, or if you really want to go crazy, you could just say headcanon that it's the same Forbidden Forest that uh, Puss in Boots and Team Friendship venture in Last Wish. Obviously, they did not have that kind of foresight, but a Forbidden Forest is such a fantasy setting that you would expect it to appear in something like this. We also have another oddity here in the form of, and I don't know if you can see that, but it says Hangman's Tower, and it's actually got a little man hanging from a noose. That is a little dark. 
and uh, conveniently located from the dead end graveyard. So you can get hung right there and buried right there. And it's a pretty grim depiction of Shrek's world. Like, looking at this almost looks like a map of Skyrim or Tamwell, right? Or something like that, where it's just all these deadly mountains and dungeons. Now, something interesting with this map is that the placement of Far, Far Away, and then above it we have Worcestershire Academy from Shrek the Third. Now, when I initially viewed this map, I was like, wait a second, don't Shrek, Puss in Boots, and Donkey take a boat to Worcester Child Academy? Wouldn't it be like on an island or a separate landmass? But if you really think about it, they take the boat to the academy and then they take a long walk on foot back and they go through Morland's shack right here. So this actually makes total sense. The, the road they mention is kind of treacherous, so they just take the boat, but the boat gets destroyed, so they have to walk back. So uh, I actually do commend the thought that was put into this. We can map out all of Shrek the Thord, you know, if you wanted to do that sort of thing. Uh, I would like to see an updated version of this map with all of the Puss in Boots locations, where is, like, uh, you know, San Ricardo and uh, San Lorenzo, like, where's the Puss in Boots TV show locations? We need all of Shrek mapped out. But my, my own headcanon for Shrek's world was that kind of uh, that Shrek sort of lives in a type of California because Far, Far Away is supposed to be Hollywood and Los Angeles. And then the Puss in Boots movies uh, pretty clearly take place in uh, Mexico or a fictional version of it, which, of course, borders California. So it would make sense that Puss in Boots would be able to cross over and go to Far, Far Away. But that is just my headcanon. And for now, all we have is this dodgy map from 2007 that some intern probably made on a lunch break. Moving on, we have Far, Far Away, and uh, I'm just going to quickly kind of go through these pages here because there's very little to say on them other than, hey, here's everything you could ever want to know about John Cleese and Julie Andrews. Here we have the Fairy Godmother, probably everyone's favorite Shrek villain. Um, will they bring her back for Shrek 5? I'm going to do a video speculating on Shrek 5, but my money's actually on no. I don't think they will bring back the Fairy Godmother. I think she is dead, dead. Backfired, as it says here. Prince Charming, who was the big bad for Shrek the Third, kind of a minor villain in Shrek 2. That was always odd, but who cares? Rupert Everett does a wonderful job in both films. He's actually one of the highlights in Shrek the Third, even if his uh, dialogue is pretty terrible. Like, he has so many cringe lines in these movies. Like, when he holds... He's a sign here. I can heal this image in my head when he holds the beverage up. And this is called a... This is called a fuzzy navel. That's the name of the beverage. And he goes, fuzzy navels for all. It's such a bad line, but... He really does deliver it, like, that's the line he was given. The other one is when he, uh, he tells Shrek, you really are a bad father when he, uh, lets down, uh, Arthur, Arthur Pendragon, over something really dumb, like, who, who remembers Shrek the Thor, right? Like, Arthur Pendragon gets mad because he finds out he was, uh, third in line to the throne, and that Shrek was second in line to the throne, when Shrek told him he was second in line. Like, it's so superfluous and dumb. Who wrote this movie? I, it's so odd. Anyways, uh, The Poison Apple, big location in uh, pretty much all of the Shrek movies, actually. Once it's introduced, we stay here a lot. And you're thinking, well, what happened to The Poison Apple? Why isn't it in the fourth film? It is the um, Chuck E. Cheese location that Shrek's kids have their party at is the Poison Apple. It kind of gets reimagined as a Chuck E. Cheese-like location, which is very funny. Moving on, we have Puss in Boots, you know, the one and only. Here is uh, Puss in Boots pre-spinoff movies. And uh, what's interesting is it uses this old render of Puss in Boots. And this one is from the uh, kind of conceptual phase. He's still got that little swirly mustache. Now, this swirly mustache was cut out at the last, last moment in the film's production. So if you look at any of the Shrek 2 merchandise, 
Uh, he always has this. This was on, like, everything for Shrek 2. But with the later films, uh, obviously it was cut because you can see it's it's not even in the final film. It's traditional whiskers. Ah, and here we have the Potion Factory, and it's another one of these cool cutaways. And uh, this one is also very richly detailed. Like, look at all the potions there. And this one does, you know, looking at this one now and seeing the detail, uh, I am led to believe that this is how the sets for Shrek and Shrek 2 were modeled. Like, like a video game, they actually mapped out the whole thing and then sort of used a camera around it, as opposed to just modeling it what you need for the scene. Because if you remember the potion lab here, uh, it's a very dynamic action sequence. It's when Shrek and Puss and Donkey, they're running around and the camera's spinning and that awesome song is playing. Um, I think it would be easier to just model the whole location than to do things shot by shot. Moving on, we have the potion transformation. So just kind of all about the happily ever after potion. And I've got to say I'm very happy that this book has so much on Shrek 2 and is not Shrek the Third centric. Oh, what I jinxed ourselves. I totally jinxed us because the next page is completely Shrek the Third centric in one of the strangest scenes of all of the Shrek franchise when King Harold dies. And it's very sad and miserable. Fiona and Lillian are dressed in black. And for some reason, Live and Let Die from James Bond is playing. And there's like cartoon frog singing. And I never quite knew what to make of this scene. As a kid, I found it really sad. I was always depressed. But, you know, rewatching the movie, I, I think it's supposed to be somewhat comedic. Because he keeps like choking on a fly heel and it's like played for laughs. I don't know. Shrek the Third Man is just an enigma of a movie. Uh, here's a scene that I do find funny from Shrek the Thord, and that's when Shrek and Fiona are getting all dolled up. And this guy here, Raoul, uh, I have said that he is the best part of Shrek the Thord. This guy is great. Another one of those images I can look at and hear in my head. He goes, I will see what I can do. And that, that that's what he says. And this scene is very funny. Moving on, we have, oh... Arthur Pendragon, or Artie, probably the worst character in the Shrek franchise. This guy is like the Jar Jar Binks of Shrek. Like, okay, it says here, more, far likely to become loser, mayor of Loserville than king of far, far away, but I don't get that. He's not a nerd. Like, there's actually nerds in the movie. These guys here are playing Dungeons and Dragons, and they make fun of him. So this guy is like, bottom of the barrel like even the nords won't hang out with him but look at him like he looks like hayden christensen soccer attack of the clones he looks like in school he would be that jock popular guy nothing about his character design says loser at all if anything this look here with the tunic and the sword this is what he should look like by the end of the movie when he becomes the heir to the throne he should start out with, like, I don't know, glasses, maybe a bad haircut. Like, he should look dorky. I never quite understood what they were going with with this character. And uh, Justin Timberlake does not do a good performance with this at all. He is one of the weakest celebrity actors in Shrek. Shrek always has done, like, celebrity casting, and they've always had a lot of talent. And don't get me wrong, Justin Timberlake is very talented, not only as a musician, but... He even did three DreamWorks movies. He did those Trolls movies that he was very good in. But for whatever reason, he was really bad in Shrek the Thor. Just not a good performance at all. Oh, and speaking of bad performances, uh, Eric Idle as Merlin. This is a terrible character. And again, Eric Idle is a funny man, but they totally wasted Merlin in Shrek. And they do this body swap plot with Donkey and Puss, and it's just so bad. This has now become a de facto Shrek the Third rant again, because what am I going to do? Read you all about Moreland's law? Who wants to read all this? Like, has any kid in the world read both of these pages? I doubt it. I actually doubt it. Here we have the rogues gallery, and uh, I do appreciate what they were trying to do here, so this page here is summarizing the end of Shrek the Third, where in order to close off, I guess, the Shrek trilogy at that point, 
uh, Prince Charming would have gathered all of the fairy tale big bad. So you've got, uh, you know, the evil queen. You've got Captain Hook. Um, Puppet Master. He's got a name, though. He's the guy from Pinocchio. I just can't think of it. Obviously, they can't say it because they don't have the copyright, but you get the idea. But somehow, this is not as awesome as you think it is. And most of these characters, like, just disappear off screen. They don't even have big action pieces. And here they are doing that final battle when they take over Far Far Away. And he's got all the witches. And uh, this scene here where all the witches, like, descend on Far Far Away is upstaged by the Shrek Forever After witch sequence. The witches in the fourth movie are so much more superior to the witches in Shrek the Thor. Just infinitely better. And here is the baby shower plotline from Shrek the Thor. I'll summarize it so you don't need to watch Shrek the Thor. One of them is a traitor, Amogus. And that one ends up being um, Rapunzel here. And it says... Snow White reveals that Rapunzel isn't a natural blonde, but it seems this icy beauty has other darker secrets. That's right, she's the twist villain. Nobody cares, nobody remembers, but I can't help but wonder if that was intentional, that choice of Rapunzel. Did DreamWorks know about what was going on with Tangled? Because Disney made Tangled uh, about three or four years after Shrek the Thorn, and that was the Disney take on Shrek. And I know that came much later, but uh, the movie Tangled was in production for a really long time. It was known for a while as Rapunzel Unbraided. And I think that movie was in production like 2004, 5, 6. And uh, it was known throughout the industry that it was going to be a Shrek-like. That Disney was making a so-called Shrek killer. And uh, the original version of Tangled would have taken place in modern-day San Francisco, and it would have been more tonally in line with Shrek. So my money is on the fact that DreamWorks knew that movie was in development, and they had an evil Rapunzel in their film just to stick it to Disney. But uh, uh, Disney ended up winning that battle because Tangled is a lot better than Shrek the Thorn. And that is actually it. The book just kind of stops from that point on. We have the baby shower, and that's it. Probably because... The publisher and DreamWorks did not want to spoil Shrek the Thorn, which was still in theaters at the time this book came out. And, uh, yeah, I, I don't think Shrek Forever After had an updated guide. So, uh, at the time of recording, this is like the complete Shrek guide we have. And sadly, this type of book has gone the way of the Dodo board. Like, I have Zootopia here, and I think this was one of the last ones they did because... Recent releases don't have this sort of thing. Uh, DreamWorks has had what recently? Uh, the Bad Guys and uh, The Wild Robot. And those do not have traditional children's books in stores. And that makes me sad. I know these books are kind of useless with the internet. But there's just something great about looking through a book like this. And getting excited for a movie. And learning all sorts of details about the characters and the lore. Like, do I need to learn... All this ridiculous stuff about Over the Hedge. No, but, you know, I read this when I was a kid, and it got me jazzed about this cool movie. It's just kind of a shame. It's one of those things that uh, has gone away, but we can always still collect them and enjoy them. And that was just me reading through and rambling about Shrek, the complete guide. And also documenting this, because a lot of these books are considered somewhat lost media, though not uploaded online, and a lot of the information on them is not known. So that's all for today. I hope you enjoyed this kind of rambly but fun video. Thanks for watching, and have a happily ever after.